that we must honestly face the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here. One day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? Martin Luther King spoke to the American conscience. When you begin to ask that question, you're raising a question about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. Now, when I say question in the whole society, it means ultimately coming to see that the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. His voice was stilled in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 4th, 1968, at 6.01 p.m. Precious Lord, take my Pacifica Radio presents The Trial of James Earl Ray, written by Mark Lane and produced for Pacifica Radio by Michael P. Hodell and Lucia Chappelle. presiding. God bless this honorable court. Be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called here today in order to try the case of the state of Tennessee versus James Earl Ray. Now this case and the unfortunate murder of Martin Luther King Jr. have been widely discussed in the news media. I'm going to ask you to dismiss from your mind everything that you've heard about this case to come to this trial with an open and unprejudiced approach. I'm going to ask you to listen to the evidence, to hear the witnesses, and to abide by my rulings as to the law. As to the facts, you are the sole judges. You must determine whether the defendant is guilty or innocent. The prosecutor will now make an opening statement. This will be followed by an opening statement from the lawyer, by the lawyer for the defendant. Mr. Crawford, you may proceed. My distinguished colleague, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the case of the state of Tennessee against James Earl Ray. The evidence will show that the defendant, acting alone, was a cold-blooded murderer of Martin Luther King Jr. The evidence will show that on April 4th, 1968, Ray did enter this building between 3 and 3.30 in the afternoon and then he appeared at the office of Bessie Brewer, who was employed as manager of this rooming house. Under the name of John Willard, James Earl Ray rented a room for a week. Now, once Ray was situated in this rooming house, he had access to this bathroom and this bathroom had an unobstructed view of the Lorraine Motel balcony and room 306 where Dr. King was registered. At 6.01 p.m., Ray fired a shot from the bathroom window and the bullet struck and killed Dr. King, who was here. Now, now we have turned over to the defense the list we have of approximately 385 witnesses 
that we could call on the case when we called it down for trial purposes in order not to be repetitive in the trial we actually subpoenaed around 85 witnesses those witnesses included people from Scotland Yard from Birmingham California Canada Portugal just to trace Ray's steps as he went along to show where he had stayed what he had done to show for example that he had purchased binoculars that were found in his suitcase on Main Street just after he killed Dr. King. However, I do not intend to call many witnesses here today. Instead, I propose to narrate to you, ladies and gentlemen, a stipulation of the facts and evidence that have been consented to by the defense in this case. A stipulation is an agreement between both sides in a lawsuit in which they accept as fact various statements and conclusions. This procedure is approved by the court or judge and you are required to accept as fact those matters that are contained in the stipulation. In this fashion, we focus upon those few but critical areas of disagreement. In those areas, I will present our witnesses to the events, including one witness Tommy Wales, who is the only eyewitness to the murder of Dr. King. After you hear his testimony, if there have been any lingering doubt in your mind until that moment, you will know beyond any shadow of a doubt and to a moral certainty that James Earl Ray killed Martin Luther King Jr. Now, 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 a stipulation in this case, signed both by the defendant in person and his lawyer, states that after Ray rented the room from Mrs. Brewer, and I add parenthetically, Mrs. Brewer would have testified to that transaction, that Ray got into his 1966 white Mustang automobile and drove to the York Arms Company, which is located one half mile north of the rooming house. At that time, he purchased from Mr. Ralph Carpenter binoculars. <laughs> they were in a case and were placed on the, in a sack by Mr. Carpenter after he collected $41.55, including tax from the defendant. The state's proof shows that between 4.30 and 4.45 p.m., Mrs. Elizabeth Copeland, who worked across the street from this area designated as Kanaf Amusement Company, observed a small white automobile pull up and park in this general area near to this light pole and south of Knipe Amusement Company. Mrs. Copeland told of Mrs. Peggy Hurley, Peggy, your husband is here for you. Mrs. Hurley came to the window and looked out and said, no, that's not my husband. My car is a Falcon and this is a white Mustang. When Mrs. Copeland left her place of employment at 5.20 p.m., that car a white Mustang, owned by James Earl Ray, was still there in front of the rooming house from which the shot was fired 41 minutes later. Now, let us backtrack a little and see what the evidence shows us about the murder weapon. The state can prove through the testimony of Mr. U.L. Baker, an employee of Aero Marine Supply Company, sporting goods store located in Birmingham, Alabama, that on Friday, March the 29th, he sold a .243 caliber Winchester rifle to James L. Ray, who used the name Harvey Lomar for the transaction. Donald Wood of Aero Marine would testify that Ray called him later that evening and said that he wanted to exchange the rifle for a larger one, and that the next morning, Saturday, at about 9 o'clock, that was done. Ray left that store with this weapon, a 30 aught six caliber Remington rifle with a telescopic sight. After Dr. King was shot to death, the bullet which killed him was removed from his neck. That bullet and this rifle were examined by Mr. Robert A. Fraser the Chief of Firearms Identification Unit at the FBI, a man of 27 years' experience. 
Mr. Fraser, to state one of his many credentials, testified before the Warren Commission, and his testimony helped to prove that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of President Kennedy. Mr. Fraser was prepared to testify as follows. I quote, The death slug was identical in all physical characteristics to the five loaded 30 aught six Springfield cartridges found in the suitcase in front of Knives. The death slug removed from the body contained land and groove impressions consistent with those present in the barrel of this rifle, unquote. In other words, this rifle fired the shot which killed Dr. King. And this rifle was purchased and owned by James Earl Ray. And it bore his fingerprints when it was found. You know where the bullet was discovered? Now, as to the rifle. After the defendant fired the shot from the bathroom window, he fled down the corridor and onto the sidewalk on South Main Street. He was carrying the murder weapon, this rifle, in a long cardboard case, and he was carrying a suitcase which had it in it his binoculars, some clothing, and a radio that he purchased while at the Missouri State Penitentiary. They dropped the rifle in the suitcase in front of Knipes, emptied his white Mustang, and drove from the scene. Now, now various officers from an attack units consisting of three police vehicles had been assigned to the area to provide mobile security. At approximately five minutes before 6 p.m., they all went to the Butler Fire Station to utilize the bathroom facilities and for a short break, having worked all day. When they heard the shot, those officers ran toward the motel where they observed the body lying there. The officers searched the area and discovered the rifle and the suitcase in front of Knipes on South Main Street. A guard was placed on that evidence and it was turned over that day to Mr. Jensen, the special agent in charge of the FBI office in Memphis, who delivered to one of his agents who carried it to Washington. This evidence was subsequently examined and it contained the rifle the Ray had purchased in Birmingham and it had his fingerprints on it. It contained a radio that he had purchased in the Missouri prison, and it had his name and identification number on it. The FBI laboratory had access to Ray's fingerprints because Ray was a fugitive and was on a wanted list. Therefore, it was possible, in fact, easy for the FBI to determine that James Earl Ray was an <coughs> obvious suspect in the murder. An investigation showed that Ray had purchased his escape vehicle, the White Mustang, in the Birmingham area from Mr. William D. Paisley for $1,995. Mr. Paisley had run an advertisement in the Birmingham paper. <coughs> Ray bought the automobile using the alias Eric S. Gault. Why did Ray kill King? The evidence is clear that he did. The evidence as to why he did is almost as clear. Ray is a violent man with a long criminal record. He has a public record of stick-ups, burglaries, and smaller crimes dating back to 1949. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Mr. Lane, you may proceed with your opening statement. Yes, Judge, thank you, but at this time, I wish to waive the opportunity to make an opening statement. I reserve, however, the right to make a statement at the close of the case. Very well. Mr. Crawford, you may call your first witness. There is one man, a scholar, who has devoted many years of his life in examining the shadowy past of James Earl Ray. The name is George McMillan. He is recognized as the accurate biographer of Ray by the New York Times. He is an authority cited by the Washington Post, major news magazines, and network television programs. 
Recently, the Washington Star's Jeremiah O'Leary wrote that Macmillan's work on Ray reflects a solid six years of original research instead of ivory tower thumbsucking. If the defense does not object, I will call as the state's first witness the distinguished author, George Macmillan. No, we do not object. I call Mr. Macmillan. George McMillan, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. You uh, are an investigative author and journalist, are you not? Yes, I am. What other important cases have you investigated? I worked on a special project for NBC television on a program about the assassination of President Kennedy. Was the program aired? No, we at NBC learned that the Warren Report rarely contained all of the relevant information about the murder of President Kennedy, and so the program never was completed since it was no longer needed. Did uh, you reach a determination about Ray's motive in murdering Dr. King? Yes. I think that his decision to kill King may have been made in 1963. As I wrote in my book, The Making of an Assassin, if I may read from it. Yes, please do. Quoting, In 1963 and 1964, Martin Luther King was on TV almost every day talking defiantly about how black people were going to get their rights, insisting that they would accept with nonviolence all the terrible violence that white people were inflicting on them until the day of victory arrived, until they did overcome. Still quoting from my book, Ray watched it all avidly on the cell block TV at Jeff City. He reacted as if King's remarks were directed at him personally. He boiled when King came on the tube. He began to call him Martin Lucifer King and Martin Luther Coon. It got so that the very sight of King would galvanize Ray. Somebody's got to get him, he would say. His face drawn with tension, his fists clenched. Somebody's got to get him. Close quotes. Since Ray actually boiled, was galvanized into action, his fists were clenched, and he proclaimed that somebody's got to get him, meaning, quite obviously, murder King, it seems clear that in 1963 and 1964 in his cell block in the Missouri Penitentiary, watching television day after day, Ray decided the King should be killed. His motive seems apparent. Thank you, Mr. McMillan, sir. Do you have another witness to be called? Yes, Your Honor. Ray's motive and inclinations have been established. The rifle that he owned had been established as the murder weapon. It is clear that the fatal shot was fired from the bathroom window. Ray had rented a room in the building from which the shot was fired approximately two and a half hours before the murder. His car, a white Mustang, which later carried him away from the murder scene, was observed in front of the Reuben house 40 minutes before the shot was fired. All that is required to prove. The law says beyond a reasonable doubt. But in this case, I say the guilt can be established to a moral certainty. All that is required is an eyewitness who saw the murder. We have the only eyewitness to the murder, and we call him now to testify. Perhaps you should call him now, Mr. Crawford, and refrain from additional comments at this time. Very well, Your Honor. The state calls Tommy Wales. Tommy Wales? This way, Mr. Wales. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Be seated. Do you remember April 4th, 1968? Yes, sir. What were you doing that day? I, well, well, I wasn't working, so I was, you know, I, I hadn't been too well, but I was just taking it easy, talking to friends, and sort of looking around for a job of some kind. What, uh, if anything, happened uh, at 5 p.m.? Well, that, that's when Willie, he's a neighbor, Will, Willie Anschutz, he come by and wanted to know who, who's in the bathroom. The bathroom was right next door to my apartment. Uh, to my room. 
I show you a diagram of the interior of the room and house. Can you identify the bathroom you're talking about? Yes, sir. It's marked there as, as A. And can you identify your room? Yes, sir. It's marked there as B. Very well, what happened next? Uh, I told Willie that it was a man who rented number five, the next room. I said he was in the bathroom, so Willie left. But he went back to the bathroom three or four more times. Did he get into the bathroom? No, sir. That fellow was still in there. He was in there for about an hour, and he didn't answer when anyone knocked on the door. Did anyone else knock on the door? Yes, sir, I did. About ten to six, I knocked on the door. It was locked, and he just stayed in there. He didn't answer or open the door. Now I know why. What happened next? I was in the kitchen wor working on my radio. That, that's next to the bathroom. Can you identify the bathroom and your kitchen on the chart? Yes, sir. The bathroom is marked A, and, and my kitchen is, is marked C. Proceed, please. Uh, what? Uh, what, what? What happened next? I was in the kitchen working on my radio. That, that's right next to the bathroom when the explosion went off. I went to the door and walked out into the hall, and I could see this man in the hall, and, and he had something in his hand. Can you identify that man? It was James Earl Ray. You have seen official police photographs of James Earl Ray, have you not? Yes, sir. And you were sure the man that you saw come out of the bathroom after the shot was fired was Ray? Uh, yes, sir, I sure am. You are excused. Thank you. In view of the stipulations previously entered into and previously discussed, and the statement of Mr. McMillan, which provides motive, and now the testimony of the only eyewitness to the actions of the murderer seconds after he fired the shot that killed King, the prosecution rests. Very well, Mr. Crawford. Both the state and the defense are to be congratulated for working out with this court's supervision, the stipulations as to the agreed-upon facts. Now, Mr. Lane, you may proceed with an opening statement or with your first witness. Thank you, Judge. Judge, District Attorney General, members of the jury, I shall reserve my statement as to the substance of the evidence for the close of the case. But now a few words about procedure. We have entered into a stipulation about the evidence with the prosecution. We have agreed about what some of the facts are, but we differ regarding the conclusions that may be fairly drawn from those facts. You, the only jury that James Earl Ray has ever had, will have the final responsibility to arrive at the appropriate conclusions and to render a fair verdict. You have heard the evidence against Mr. Ray presented fully and indeed eloquently by the prosecutor. We have, all of us, heard those official conclusions for the past nine years. We begin now to confront the official myths of the past with the evidence. Since you have agreed not to make an opening statement, Mr. Lane, yes. why don't you just call your witnesses? Yes, Your Honor, I was uh, just about to do that. We call at this time Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. Welcome to Memphis, Mr. Ford. Thank you, sir. Where do you reside? In Jefferson City, Missouri, at the State Penitentiary. I take it that you are not an inmate there? No, I'm the warden. How long have you been a part of the administration at the penitentiary? Since 1961. I was associate warden then and became warden on the retirement of Wayne Jarvis, the former warden, in 1969. Are you familiar with the conditions that existed at the penitentiary in 1963 and in 1964? Yes, sir. During that time, did the inmates have access to television sets? No. No television sets were available to the inmates at that time. During the entire confinement of James Earl Ray at the Missouri State Penitentiary, was it ever possible for him to view a television set? I've brought with me, pursuant to your subpoena ducus tecum, the relevant records. Uh, may I refer to them? Yes, you may refer to them if you need them to refresh your recollection. Ray escaped from the penitentiary on April 23rd, 1967. Prior to that time, no television sets were available to the inmates. In February 1968, 
Television sets were permitted in the day room with limited access to various inmates. In January 1970, television sets purchased by prisoners were permitted on the cell blocks for the first time. Now, since Ray left in April 1967 and never returned, I can answer categorically that he never had access at the Missouri State Penitentiary to a television set. What was Ray's attitude at the penitentiary toward black prisoners? Object, it is hardly relevant to the issues here. That may be true, but you made it relevant by offering testimony designed to demonstrate that the defendant is a racist and that his racism formed the basis for his motive. We merely put a witness who testified about what Ray said and what he did when he saw Mr. King. Now, if you believe that proves that he's a racist, you are entitled to your belief. Both of you gentlemen are experienced trial lawyers, and you both know there should be no colloquy between you. I am instructing you to address your arguments to me and not to each other. Now, Mr. Lane, this hardly seems like an important point, but I will permit you one question, and then let's move on to something more important. During Ray's confinement at the Missouri State Penitentiary, what was Ray's attitude toward the black prisoners? Ah, Jack, there is no evidence to show that this gentleman knew about Ray's attitude. Yes, objection sustained. Do you know what Ray's actions were regarding black prisoners and other minority prisoners at the penitentiary? Yes, sir. I observed Ray and the other prisoners. That was my job. And what was Ray's attitude toward those prisoners if you were able to determine that fact from your observations? There was nothing unusual about it. He worked with black prisoners, also with Chicana and Orientals. He never complained, neither did they. Thank you. I have no further questions. At this time, the defense calls Alice James. Alice James? Please approach the witness chair. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. What is your name? Alice James. How old are you? Fifty-seven. Have you attended schools here in Memphis, Tennessee? Yes, sir. I graduated from Memphis State University Teachers College, and I did some temporary and student teaching. And what what other jobs have you held here in the Memphis area? I was in charge of the leather goods department at Lowenstein's for seven years. I also was the manager bookkeeper for an apartment complex of 40 efficiency apartments in downtown Memphis for some years. And where do you reside now? Well, I live at... They keep me at the Southern State Hospital in Martin, Tennessee. Why are you there? Objection. Sustained. Very well. Um, Do you remember April 4th, 1968? Yes, sir, I do. That's why I'm at the hospital, because I wouldn't lie about what I saw that day. Well, now, now that's just outrageous. That's coming in through the back door when the court has closed the front door and closed it quite properly, I might add. I take that objection as a motion to strike the answer as not being responsive, and I grant the motion. You all are to put out of your mind the witness's last sentence in her answer. Hmm. What did you see that day, April 4th, 1968? Well, I was in my room next to the bathroom. I was sitting in the bed, propped up in the bed, and I was reading. Tommy, that's Tommy Wells, the man I was living with. He was there too, but he was drinking as usual. For a while, he just flopped on the bed. That's when the taxi driver came to carry him. I guess to a bar, but Tommy was too drunk to go with him. About when was that? Can you, can you place the time? Well, sir, it was about 15 or 20 minutes before 6 o'clock. How can you remember that time? Well, I heard the shot when they killed Dr. King, and that was just about 6 o'clock. And this was about 15 or 20 minutes before then. Mm -hmm. What happened after the taxi driver left? His name is Jack McGee, and he's known Tommy for a very long time. Tommy got up a few minutes later and said he had to go to the bathroom. He didn't use those exact words, but I'd rather not repeat his exact words. Yes. And he went to the bathroom door. He left the door to our room partially open, and I could see into the corridor, and I could see the bathroom door. Well, I paid no heed to Tommy. I just kept on reading. But then I heard a loud noise. What what was that? 
Oh, it was Tommy banging on the bathroom door and yelling to the person in the bathroom that he'd been in there all afternoon and that he didn't own the bathroom and that Tommy had to use the toilet. Tommy had been drinking beer all day, many quarts of beer, and he probably did have to use the bathroom. Had that man been in the bathroom all afternoon? Well, he'd been there for about one hour. You see, Willie Anschutz, our neighbor, had tried to get in there at about five o'clock and several times after that, and he couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. He complained to me about it, said he wanted to know who was in there. Did you know who was in there? No, sir. Not at that time. And did Tommy know who was in there? I object. The question presumes that the witness is familiar with the operation of the mind of another person. Objection sustained. What did Tommy say when he banged on the bathroom door? He said, I have to use the goddamn toilet. When no one answered, he said, Who the hell are you anyway? Who's in there? Hmm. Then what happened? Well, Tommy went down the stairs in the back of the building. There's a staircase right there with a railing that goes right to the bathroom door. And Tommy went down those stairs. Do you know where Tommy went after he went down the back stairs? Well, the stairs lead out to the backyard, so he either went there or to the bathroom in the building next door. And then what happened? Well, I just went back to my reading for a few minutes, and then I heard a rifle shot. It came from the bathroom, and I recognized it as a shot at once. You did? How could you tell it was a shot and not a backfire or some other kind of an explosion? My father was a great hunter, and he taught us all about weapons. And my husband... Not Tommy, but Kenneth James, the man I was married to. He was a gun collector. Oh, I recognized it as a shot right off. And what did you do? What did you see after you heard that shot? Well, I stopped reading my book and looked into the corridor from my room. I looked at the closed bathroom door. Where was Tommy at that time? I don't know. Next door or out in the backyard, I suppose. He had not returned to the building yet? Objection. Leading question. Sustained. All right, I'll rephrase it. Where was Tommy, to your knowledge, at the time that you heard the shot? I don't know where he was, but he had not come back up the stairs yet. Uh-huh. And then what happened? Well, I was looking at that door. Naturally, I knew that whoever fired the shot had to come out of there. And then the bathroom door opened and a man came out. He was walking very swiftly down the corridor, right past my door. And then I lost sight of him. Can you describe... That man? Yes, sir. He was a small man. Not taller than I am. Certainly not much taller. Maybe an inch or so. How tall are you? Five feet three inches. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what that man was wearing? Yes, sir. He wore a hunting jacket and it was partially open. Under it he had on a loud checkered shirt. Bright colored shirt. And he had something in his right hand. What did he have in his right hand? I couldn't say for sure, because his body was between me and what he had. He carried it near the railing, and he swung it as he walked. He was moving pretty quickly. Yes, well, what did you do then? Well, I wasn't really dressed at that time, not so as to go outside. <coughs> so I got up at once and started to get dressed. Then just after I got dressed, I heard Tommy come up the stairs, and then he came toward the room. How much time elapsed? after you heard the shot and saw the man walk down the corridor and before Tommy came into the room? Oh, he didn't come into the room. I met him in the hallway. I dressed quickly. I thought there was trouble there. Maybe five minutes after I saw the man leave, passed, before Tommy came back up the stairs. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? When Tommy came up, I told him what happened. Tommy then went down the hall and walked toward the front of the building, said he wanted to see the man, and Tommy motioned for me to follow him. I told Tommy the man was probably long gone by then. Then Tommy came back into the room. Do you know if Tommy ever did see the man? Well, I don't see how. The man had just shot someone. Why would he wait for five minutes when he was walking so quickly to get out of there before then? I move to strike the answers being speculative. The motion is granted. Mm -hmm. Fine. Mrs. James, do you know if Tommy actually saw the man? I don't know if he looked at him, but I know he didn't see him. I object. I move to strike the answer. How could she know he didn't see him? 
Perhaps the witness can answer your question, Mr. Prosecutor, if you will just give her a chance. Now, I warned you both about colloquy. You will address this court and not bicker with each other. I mm. surely apologize, Your Honor, for my part. Mm. Yes. Well, you may proceed, Mr. Lane. You said you know that Tommy did not see the man. Yes, sir. How do you know that? Well, Tommy had left his glasses on the bed when he left to go to the bathroom. And he never did get back into the room till after he went down the corridor and came back. Tommy can't see across the room without his glasses. Mm -hmm. Were you questioned by police officers later that same day? Yes, sir. Well, it was a mess. Police, reporters, the FBI, and more reporters. And what did you tell them? Well, the same things I just told you. And did they show you any photographs? Yes, sir. But first I described the man to an artist from a Memphis newspaper. He was working with the police and FBI. The artist drew a picture of the gunman according to how I described him. Now, Miss James, uh, I show you this photograph, this drawing, and I ask you if this is a photograph of the artist's drawing. Yes, sir. And was that based upon your description? Yes, sir, it was. And were you shown photographs by the police authorities at that time? Later that day, the FBI and the police had me to look at photographs. Did you make an identification at that time? I told them that one picture which I picked out looked very much like the man. That it seemed to be a picture of the man I saw leave the bathroom. Who was that a picture of, if you know? They never did tell me. Well, of course, since that time, you have seen pictures of James Earl Ray, have you not? Yes, sir. Since that time, not that day. Was James Earl Ray the man you saw leave the bathroom and flee down the corridor just after you heard the shot? No, sir. Didn't look anything like him. James, I show you an official police photograph of James Earl Ray. I ask you if this is the man that you saw fleeing down the corridor from the bathroom door on April 4th. 1968. I never saw that man in my life. Now, Ray was just 40 years old at that time. How old was the man who you saw? He was in his late 50s or early 60s. Ray is 5 feet 11 inches tall with a medium build. How tall was the man you saw? He was about 5 feet 4 inches and very small boned. He was a really small man. Now, did you give the police and the FBI agents this description of the man who you had seen? Yes, of course. And what was their response? Well, they made notes and told me I would be contacted later. And were you contacted later? Yes, sir. About two weeks later when they announced they were looking for James Earl Ray and they published his picture in the paper, they called me into the police station. They told me that he was that man who murdered Martin Luther King. What did you say? I told them that he was not the right man, that he was not the man who came out of the bathroom. And they said, the police and the FBI, that I would be in trouble if I didn't identify Ray. Trouble. And what did you say? I said I couldn't change the facts. I saw the man, and he was smaller, older, shorter, and didn't look at all like James Earl Ray. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after that? The FBI and the police told me not to tell anyone what I believed, to be quiet about what I saw. They said I could be in danger if I talked about what I saw. Did you talk with the police authorities after that? Yes, sir. Several weeks later, Ray was arrested in <clears throat> England. And the police and the FBI came and got Tommy and me and carried us to the FBI office. They told us that we were to sign a paper, an affidavit, which said that Ray was the man we saw. They said there was a reward of over $100,000 if we signed the statement, because then Ray would be convicted. They also said we could be in trouble in danger if we didn't sign the affidavit. Did you sign the affidavit? No. Why not? I told you. The man I saw was not James Earl Ray. Did Tommy sign the affidavit? I think he did. They put us in different rooms. 
Then this plain clothes detective or, or FBI agent came back and said that Tommy had signed, and why didn't I sign too, or I would be in trouble. And then what happened? I didn't sign. I went home. Then later, two plainclothes officers took me to the John Gaston Hospital in Memphis, and they locked me up in there for about three weeks with mental patients. Most of them were very old. Then they took me to a court. Would you describe for your jury your trip to the court? Oh, now, this is totally irrelevant about her trip to court. It does seem very far afield, Mr. Lane. Judge, this woman was placed in a mental institution. Now, that may raise certain questions about her competence as a witness. It certainly does, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think it is a disgrace to drag this poor, confused creature here to tell a story. Well, that does it, Judge. Mr. Crawford's remarks certainly require that we have the opportunity to explain the nature of and the basis of her commitment in a mental institution. Well, all right, but don't spend too much time on this witness. It is just not important enough, as I'm sure the jury will agree. I move to strike that remark from the record. What remark? My remark? Yes, the jurors are the judges of the fact, and it is improper for you to attempt to influence them. Well, Mr. Lane, there's a presumption that when a witness comes from a lunatic asylum... There is only the... one presumption in a criminal case, Judge, and that is the innocence of the defendant. At this point... I move for the withdrawal of a juror and the declaration of a mistrial. That is denied. Now move along. You can ask her about her version of how she got into the mental institution, but don't dwell on it. We have more important questions here. More important? Of the three billion people who share this planet with us, Judge, this witness is the only one who saw the killer just after he shot Dr. King. What could possibly be more important than her testimony? Now, I said you could proceed with your questions, but don't make any more speeches. I have never held a lawyer in contempt, but I am now on the verge of it. Don't answer. Just proceed with your questions. Would you please describe your trip to the court? The people were mostly old. We were chained. Do you mean handcuffed? No, chained. Our ankles were chained together. A chain was put around our waist, and our wrists were chained to that chain, and we were all chained together. It was very hard to walk. They put us in a bus and then took us out at the court. We had to wait outside of the court, and it was raining. They also gave us all medicine, and I can't remember it so well. I was sort of dazed. A doctor talked to me. How long did the doctor talk to you? About two or three minutes. Do you recall what he asked you? Why I was there. And what did you say? I told him I was there because of what I saw on April 4th when Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered. And he asked me if I was afraid of anything. I told him I was afraid of the trial of James Earl Ray because the police and FBI wanted me to lie and said I would be in trouble if I told what I saw. And he asked me if I was afraid of anything else. And I told him that Tommy always beat up on me and was angry with me for not signing the affidavit and I was afraid of him. And then what happened? They brought me in front of the judge. I looked a sight. My hair was all wet. My clothes were all wet. I didn't feel right from the medicine. I couldn't talk too clearly. The doctor told the judge that I had been hallucinating, that I thought I was an important witness of the murder of Dr. King, and that I was afraid of the trial and that I was afraid of Tommy. The judge said to me, don't worry. You won't have to be at any trial. And you won't be with Tommy Wales. Then he signed a document. And they sent me to Southern State Hospital in Martin, Tennessee. When did these events take place? 
in the summer of 1968. How long have you been at the Southern State Hospital? Since then, for more than nine years. I move to strike all of her testimony. It is an insult to this court and to this jury <clears throat> to parade a witness from a lunatic asylum before this court. That's why she was placed there. What? So that you could make that remark so that the one witness to the murder could be destroyed as a witness by the state of Tennessee, so, so that the cover-up of facts could continue sir, right here in this courtroom. Sir, so are you charging me with contempt for being a part of some kind of conspiracy? You are part of the conspiracy. There will be enough of that. Well, the facts charge the officials in this state, Judge, with being accessories after the fact in the murder of Dr. King. This is the single most outrageous charge that I have ever heard uttered in a courtroom. You will both be silent. We will take a recess for 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of the evidence is not yet in. I instruct you not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Mr. Lane, I will see you in my chambers now. This court will recess for 10 minutes. All rise. Court will reconvene in 10 minutes. Mr. Lane, you may call your next witness. We call Jack McGee. Jack McGee? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. What is your name? Jack McGee. Are you presently employed? Yes, sir. I drive a taxi for the Checker Taxi Cab Company of Memphis. And how long have you been so employed? For 32 years. Do you know Tommy Wales? Yes, sir. For about 25 years. 25 years? Does that make you his oldest friend? I didn't say I was his friend. I've been drinking with him, though. Hmm. On how many different occasions have you seen him? Maybe 500 times or more. And what portion of those times was he sober? I never saw him sober. Did you see him on April 4th, 1968? Yes, sir. In Jim's Grill. I went in for lunch at about 12.30 and Tommy was at the bar in there drinking beer. His social security check arrives on the third of each month. This was the fourth, and he was drinking. Hmm. Was he there when you left Jim's Grill after lunch? No, sir. At about one o'clock, he bought three quarts of beer and left. He carried it in a sack up to his room. Did you see him later that same day? Sure did. I was driving my taxi, and I got a call from my dispatcher to go to 422 and a half South Main and pick up Tommy Wales. And did you go there? Yes, sir, but I didn't pick up Tommy. Why not? He was drunk, almost dead drunk, almost passed out on the floor. Was anyone else in the room at that time? Yes, sir. Alice James was there, sitting on the bed, reading a book, I think. Just tell us what you know, not what you think. Did you talk to Tommy? I just said, you're too drunk to haul. And did he answer you? It wasn't exactly an answer, more like a grunt or a mumble. He tried to get up, but he was too drunk to make it. I see. And then what did you do next? I went back to my cab and called the dispatcher. I told him that Tommy Wales was too drunk to carry, and he gave me another assignment. What was that other assignment? To pick up a fare at Frank and Johnny's near the pier. And did you go there? Yes, sir. But before I got there, the dispatcher called back and said to be careful. King had just been shot, and police cars were expected to be out. How long is the trip from 422 and a half South Main Street to Frankie and Johnny's? About 10 minutes, maybe 15 at most. Did you observe Tommy Wales in a drunken condition less than 15 minutes before Dr. King was shot? Yes, sir, I did. Now, you were served with a subpoena ducus tecum, were you not, requiring you to bring with you the records of the taxi company? Yeah, but I couldn't get those records of the dispatcher sending me to South Main and the record of why I didn't take Tommy. Why couldn't you get those records? The FBI took those records from the company the next day. In other words, the FBI knew of the allegation that Tommy Wales was drunk at the time of the murder. Yeah, and the police knew it too because they questioned me. And others knew it, too. Object. The answer's not responsive. The witness is volunteered information. Objection you knew it, too. Sustained. 
You knew it too. You questioned me the day the king was killed, and you told me not to tell anyone about what I saw. Mr. McGee, you are not to argue with the prosecutor, and you are not to accuse him. He is not the defendant here. Let's understand one thing. Mr. Ray is the defendant, not Mr. Crawford. Mr. Lane, you had best demonstrate better control of your witnesses, or you will be in serious trouble. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. McGee. I have no further questions. Do you have another witness? Yes. At this time, the defense calls James Earl Ray. James, it's been said that during uh, 1963 and 1964, while you were in a cell block at the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City, that you saw Dr. King on television every single day. Yes. And according to Mr. McMillan, uh, an author, you boiled, you were galvanized into action, your knuckles turned white, and you said, somebody's got to get him, somebody's got to get him. Is any of that true? No, that's uh, incorrect. In fact, there were no televisions in there during the period I was in the Missouri Penitentiary. There was no television set there no. available to you in 1963 and 1964? No. They had one television set. They used, it was on the yard. It wasn't a cell block. They put it on top of a recreation shack in the yard. It would stay there from 12 noon until 2 o'clock, and you could watch a football game. After that, they disconnected. Did you ever talk in the Missouri Penitentiary or any place else before April 4th, 1968, about killing Dr. King? No, I never did mention his name. Never mentioned his name? No. All right. Uh, now, Dr. King was killed at 6.01 p.m. on April 4th, 1968. Do you know where you were at that time? I'm not positive. I think I was in the area of, uh, on Linden Street, possibly at a, at a service station. There's a Texaco station there? Yes, sir. Is that where you were at that time? I'm not certain of the name of the station, but I, I know there's two, at least two or three stations in that area, and they were a major brand. What vehicle did you have with you at that time? Um, white Mustang, 1966. And what plates were on it? Alabama plates. And why were you in the service station, whichever service station yes, it was? getting a tire fix. And about how long were you there? I couldn't speculate. It was a busy time of day, and I may have been there as long as uh, 10 minutes, uh, but I can't say at this time. All right. Um, why were you in Memphis in April 1968 in the first place? It was my understanding we were supposed to purchase some guns and apparently take them to New Orleans. And that was all I knew about the project. Who told you about the project? An individual I was associated with named Raoul. And where'd you meet Raoul? In uh, Montreal, Canada. And what was your first contact with him? I think my first business dealing, are you, are you talking about? The first time you met him. Well, that was, uh, I was trying to get a passport at that time, or Merchant Seaman's papers. That was in a bar in Montreal. And he offered to make some papers available to you? Uh, later on, yes, if I would, uh, help him take some stuff, some uh, merchandise across the border. Contraband. Yes, contraband. And did you do that? Yes. And did he pay you? Well, he didn't give me no pay. I didn't receive a passport, although I did receive a certain amount of money, $1,500 or yeah. $1,700, I forget just what. And how long were you in contact with Raul during this time period, from the time you escaped until, uh, until the time Arrest. you last saw him? Well, probably from September 67 until April 68, which would be eight months. Sir. And during that time you were doing various things for him? Yes. And what did he ask you to do in re which brought you to Memphis? Well that was, he asked me to purchase a rifle and also we inquired about surplus rifles. And uh, did you purchase Army a rifle? surplus. Yes, I did purchase a rifle. Where was that? That was an Aero, means, Aero Marine Supply in Birmingham, Alabama, right across from the airport. And where was Raul when you were in Birmingham? Now he was in the motel part of the time and I think uh, a uh, bar called Starlight Lounge uh, other times. In Birmingham? Yes. And did you check uh, with Raoul after you purchased the rifle? Yes. And what did he say? It was the wrong type. So he wants you to go back and get a bigger one? Yes, I had a brochure. They gave me a brochure when I purchased the first one, uh -huh. and he pointed the correct one out, and I went back, and uh, well, I called back, and they told me they would exchange it. What, when did you last see that rifle? Uh, April 3rd, 1968. The day before Dr. King yes, was killed? Yes, motel. And eventually you ended up in a, uh, in a rooming house on South Main Street. Yes. Is that correct? And uh, were you there alone? No. There's one other individual, this individual called Raul. And he was I, there? Yes. And when you left there that afternoon, was Raul still in that rooming house? Uh, yes, he was still there. About what time was that that you last saw him? I would estimate it would be 
uh, quarter after five or, or maybe later, so, but in that general vicinity of time. Do you know who killed Dr. King? I don't know. Did you kill Martin Luther King? No. Are you innocent of the charge that That's, you killed Dr. King? Yes. The defense calls Wilson Jordan. Wilson Jordan? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. What is your occupation, Mr. Jordan? I'm the vice president of the Western Tennessee First National Bank, located here in Memphis. Do you recall April 4th, 1968? Yes, sir, I do. Where were you at approximately 5.40 p.m. that day? Well, I was driving my car to an area just outside of downtown Memphis to pick up a friend. I was several minutes early, and I parked on Linden between 2nd and 3rd. I was there, sitting in my parked car at 5.40 p.m. I was parked just outside of a major service station. What did you see at that time? Well, I saw a man pass just in front of my vehicle and walk over to a two- or three-year-old white Mustang with out-of-state plates. That vehicle was parked in the service station. My family's from Arkansas. I thought that the license plates were Arkansas plates. The man opened the trunk of the car, looked inside, then walked over to and talked with an employee at the service station. Then he walked back past me. I looked at him closely because I thought I might know him. I had nothing to do but wait, so I walked over to the Mustang and saw that the plates were from Alabama. Uh, both states were red and white that year. Did you ever see that man again? Yes, sir. He came back into the service station about 30 seconds before my friend arrived. Mm -hmm. What did you do when your friend arrived? Well, we drove off. But we were stopped as emergency vehicles crossed in front of us just about ten minutes later. They were police cars and ambulances. Do you know where they were going? Yes, sir. They went to the Lorraine Motel on Mulberry Street. They were responding to the call there after Dr. King was shot. And where was the white Mustang, and where was the man that you saw with it? The last time I saw that car and that man, they were at the service station on Linden between 2nd and 3rd, about eight blocks from the Lorraine Motel. And what time was that? The car and the man were there at 5.45 or 5.50 p.m. Did you ever see that man again? Approximately two weeks later, I was eating breakfast at the Steak and Eggs. I purchased and read a local newspaper. It carried a picture of James Earl Ray. I knew then that I had seen Ray several minutes before the murder of Dr. King. He was the man in the service station. Mr. Jordan, I'm going to show you this picture. It's an official police photograph, as you can see, of James Earl Ray. I ask you if this is the man that you saw on April 4th, 1968. Yes, sir. This is a picture of the man I saw. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Jordan. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Would you please sit down again? You don't mind answering a few questions for me, do you? Well, no, sir. Fine, fine. Now, you uh, have a rather responsible position at your bank, vice president, isn't it? Yes, sir. And do you consider yourself to be a responsible person and a responsible leader of our Memphis community? Well, I like to think of myself as a responsible person in all areas of my life. However, I'm not a community leader. Well, now, now, Mr. Responsible Citizen, after you decided that you had seen James Earl Ray two weeks after you saw him, what did you do about it? Who did you tell about it? Or did you decide to keep your information secret for nine years to surprise us all? Well, I told various friends about it at you the time. You told various friends? You told various friends. <laughs> A responsible citizen, and you refused to report your information to the police or the FBI, didn't you? I wouldn't say I refused. But you wouldn't say that you did tell the authorities that you thought Ray was innocent. Well, you didn't tell the police that, did you? Well, no, sir, I didn't, but the reason I I didn't, didn't ask for your reasons. I have no further questions. A question or two on direct, please, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan, why did you not tell the police what you saw that day? Well, I didn't know it was Ray until the FBI and police said he was the murderer. That's when his picture was published. Well, they said they had an ironclad case against him, including witnesses who saw him fire the shot. Well, I didn't think what I saw was relevant or important. I saw him about eight blocks away, about ten minutes before the shot was fired. I thought that meant that he was in the neighborhood and that he could have gone to the room and house to fire the shot. Well, it wasn't until you told me recently that the killer was locked in the bathroom from five to six that evening that I even understood the significance of what I had seen. Thank you. I have no further questions.
At this time, the defense calls Ed Reddit. Ed Reddit? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. What is your name? Ed Reddit. What was your occupation during the month of April 1968? I was a detective, a warrant officer with the Memphis Police Department. Mr. Reddit, do you recall your assignment on April 3rd and on April 4th of 1968? Yes, I do. What was your assignment? Dr. Martin Luther King was visiting <clears throat> Memphis. There were many death threats against him. I was placed in charge of stationary security for Dr. King. And where were you stationed? I was at fire station number two, which was just across from the Lorraine Motel. Now you said you were in charge of stationary security for Dr. King. Yes. Was there any other kind of security for Dr. King that day? There were mobile units in the vicinity, and I had immediate access to those units through radio communication. Had you ever been in charge of security for Dr. King prior to April 3rd, 1968? Yes, I always was given that assignment. I provided both security and surveillance. Security for Dr. King and his party and surveillance for the Memphis Police Department so that they would be apprised of what was taking place. Had you prepared for this assignment prior to April 3rd? I object, Your Honor. This question is not relevant. Judge, I think that with just another question or two, the relevancy will be well established. Well, we'll give you another question or two, but these answers are subject to being connected up in the near future. Yes. Um, had you prepared for this assignment in the past? Yes, I had. How had you? I became familiar with everyone who might be around Dr. King. I knew who to look for. I could identify everybody who came and went. I knew the Southern Christian Leadership Conference personnel, I knew Dr. King, I knew the cars they drove, and I knew their license plate numbers. I knew the local Klansmen by sight. I knew the ministers, the militant groups. I knew everyone involved in the leadership of the sanitation strike. Now, in the past, Detective Reddit, how many men worked under your direction in order to provide security for and surveillance of Dr. King? Sometimes 10, sometimes 12. And on April 4th, 1968, how many men worked under your direction? No object. I don't even know where this is leading. We'll give Mr. Lane just a few minutes to connect this all up. Proceed. How many men worked under your direction on April 3rd and April 4th? By April 3rd, all of the security had been removed with the exception of one patrolman named W.R. Richmond. Our entire security program consisted of Richmond and myself. Mm -hmm. Now, in all of the many times that you had provided security for Dr. King in the past, had you ever had your security team reduced to just two men, including yourself? Object. That is completely irrelevant. Sustained. Judge, I believe... That I've made my ruling. Don't argue with me. Proceed to your next question. Hmm. Did you and Richmond have a plan in case any violence was used against Dr. King? Yes, we did. I had developed a plan, and I informed Richmond in detail as to how that plan would be effectuated. What was the plan? Well, we were down to a total of two men, so the plan was very simple. We were there across Mulberry Street from the Lorraine Motel. If anything happened to Dr. King while he was at the motel, Richmond was to run full speed carrying his walkie-talkie into the courtyard of the Lorraine Motel. He was to notify all of the mobile security, you know, the police officers and yes. vehicles, mm -hmm. and they were responsible for sealing off the area so that anyone who caused the trouble would be trapped within a small perimeter. And what was your obligation under that plan? I was to run through the fire station out to South Main Street and cut off access onto South Main Street from any of the buildings which overlooked the Lorraine Motel. I figured if anyone shot at Dr. King, those shots might come from one of those buildings on South Main. Yes, what had led you to that conclusion? Well, I was providing security for the man, and the obvious place for a sniper seemed to me to be one of those buildings, and those buildings exited onto South Main Street. Now, was that plan that you had developed, was that plan implemented at 6.01 p.m. on April 4th, 1968, when Dr. King actually was shot? No, it was not. Why not? About two hours before Dr. King's assassination, Lieutenant Arkin, who was in intelligence, came down to the station. He said, Ed, they want to see you at headquarters. I had difficulty leaving since my plan to cut off a potential escape from the scene, should there be an attempt on Dr. King's life, was predicated upon a functioning team of at least two men. Well, Arkin told me that Holloman himself had ordered me to report to him at headquarters. So what could I do? 
I got into the car with Arkin, leaving Richmond all alone, and we proceeded to headquarters. Now, who was Holloman? He was the, the director of fire and police in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Now, how long had he ha held that position? He got the job just a little while before the sanitation strike began, and he left not long after the assassination. He said he didn't want to answer a lot of questions about the assassination. Did you know Holloman well? No, I didn't know him well. Had you seen him around the Memphis Police Department before 1968? No, he was not an officer who worked his way up. He had been a top official of the FBI. He was with the FBI for 25 years. He had been the chief inspector for J. Edgar Hoover. Holloman personally ran J. Edgar Hoover's personal office in Washington. I object. This is an effort to inflame the jury. You're quite right, Mr. Crawford. Mr. Lane, there will be no more speeches against the FBI in this courtroom. And all statements about Mr. Holloman's association with the FBI are ordered struck from this record. They are just not relevant. Relevant. Where did you report to at police headquarters, Detective? Upon arriving at police headquarters, I was taken into the conference room. It was like a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In this room, just before Dr. King was murdered, were the heads and the seconds in command of, I guess, every law enforcement operation in this area you could think of. I had never seen anything like it before. The sheriff, the highway patrol, army intelligence, the National Guard, you name it, it was in the room. I walked right in and Holloman addressed me at once. He said, Ed, there's a contract out on you. I says, what do you mean? I couldn't understand why I was there at this top level meeting and why I was being told about a contract on me in front of that whole group. The whole thing didn't make any sense. Holloman then introduced me to a man in the room dressed in civilian clothes. I remember very clearly that Holloman indicating a man at the conference table said, Ed, this gentleman is from the United States Secret Service in Washington, D.C. He has secured information from the Highway Patrol in Mississippi that a group in Mississippi has a contract out to kill you. So, Ed, in order to protect you, I have personally made reservations for you and your family at the Rivermont Holiday Inn. You and your family are to move in there right now for your safety. Well, my first thought was that Dr. King was going to be leaving the Lorraine shortly and that I should be there. Then I thought about my mother-in-law, who was really quite ill, and I said to Holloman, Sir, I'm not going. You can't stop a contract. If there's one on me, I'll just stay on the streets and try to be cautious. But I won't involve my family. If they're going to get me, then let them get me on the streets while I'm nowhere near my family. Holloman answered sharply, Read it, you are going to the river mountain with your family. That's in order, and there's nothing to discuss. I told Holloman that my mother-in-law was too sick to be moved and too sick to be left alone. Holloman thought for a moment and said, all right, you just go home and stay there. Well, I asked if I could finish my assignment at the Lorraine first. Holloman said, you are going home and you are going home now, that's an order. Well, I drove home with Memphis police officers and when they drove up in front of my house, the Memphis police informed me that they were going to stay in my house with me. Well, at that point, it became clear to me that their assignment quite obviously was to watch me, not guard the house. I object to this officer's statement about what was in the mind of another police officer. Objection sustained. That remark will be stricken from the record. What happened next, Detective Reddick? Well, I sat in the car and thought about Dr. King. I had been with him so much every time he came to Memphis, and I had heard him speak so often that I practically was one of his disciples. I thought about him at the Lorraine without adequate protection. Your Honor, I move to strike from the record the thought processes that this detective has testified under. Motion granted. Detective Red Reddit, what happened next? So we sat in the car for a few minutes, and then the radio announced that Dr. King had been shot. What did you do when you heard that Dr. King had been shot? I ran into the house as soon as I heard the news. I thought it would be too much of a shock for my wife's mother and we thought she didn't have a radio. But she did have a small transistor radio, and she heard that he had been killed. And in the middle of the night, she screamed out, Dr. King, Dr. King, Dr. King. Oh, God, take me instead of Dr. King. And she died. She died of grief. I move to strike all of that testimony about his wife's mother. This is just an obvious effort to appeal to passion and prejudice. 
You are quite right. You are to disregard all of the testimony given by this man which I have already struck from the record. Now I think, Mr. Lane, you have gone far enough, much too far, in fact, with this witness. You are excused. Do you have any further witnesses? No, I do not. However, I offer this certified record of the arrests and convictions of the prosecution witness, Tommy Wales, and this file of documents regarding the commitment of Alice James, the defense witness. And at this time, Your Honor, the defense rests. Very well. Mr. Lane, I think you reserved your right to make a statement at this point in the case. Do you wish to be heard at this time? Yes, Judge. Yes, I do wish to be heard at this time. Very well, Mr. Lane. Your Honor, Mr. District Attorney, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the evidence is now in, and it is my responsibility in this closing argument to summarize it all from the defense perspective just as the prosecutor did in his opening statement from the state's point of view. Now, what did the prosecutor attempt to prove at this trial? I submit that he tried to prove three points. One, that the defendant, James O'Reilly, is a racist, a racist who often spoke of murdering Dr. King years before the crime was committed. Secondly, he attempted to prove that the rifle that was purchased and owned by James Earl Ray was the murder weapon, was the weapon which was used to kill Dr. King on April 4th, 1968. The third point that the prosecution labored to make was that they had an eyewitness, a witness who actually saw the defendant, James Earl Ray, leave the bathroom from which the shot had been fired and leave it moments after the shot had been fired from that bathroom. Let's examine for a moment each of the three propositions that the prosecution attempted to present. One, the proof which the prosecution sought to offer regarding the background of the defendant, the motivation of the defendant, all of the proof reposed on the witness stand for a brief moment in American history when George McMillan came before us and read again from his book, The Making of an Assassin. He told us, of course, that James Earl Ray stared at the television set day after day after day in 1963 and 1964, and not just that, but he was galvanized, galvanized into action when he saw Dr. Martin Luther King speak on behalf of the struggles of black people in America. And he boiled, and his, and his face turned red and flushed, and his hands grabbed the cell block rails, and his knuckles turned white. We had a great physical description of a man on the verge of a fit. What was wrong with it? Well, they didn't have any television sets there in the prison. And the whole description of the physical reaction to Dr. King, including somebody's got to get a meeting, quite obviously someone's going to murder him, has to murder him, all made up, all fanciful. Now, the prosecution did tell us something about Mr. McMillan, which in fact was accurate, just one thing. He said that he is the darling of the establishment, that the New York Times thinks he's just fine, that Jeremiah O'Leary in the Washington Star says he is involved in original research. Oh, it's original, all right. It's not based upon any factual basis. It's very original research. What they didn't tell us, however, is who Jeremiah O'Leary is, the man who loves George McMillan so fondly. Jeremiah O'Leary, if we read the Church Committee of the United States Senate, is a man found by the United States Senate to be an asset to use the language of the Central Intelligence Agency, an asset of the CIA, a man who would publish false information at the request of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and a man who published false information regarding James Earl Ray at the request of J. Edgar Hoover, then the director of the FBI. And Mr. O'Leary thinks Mr. McMillan is just fine. 
But the warden who came here to tell us what the conditions really were at the prison made it quite plain. Ray never saw Dr. King on a television set in his cell block because they had no television sets there. Now we get to the second statement made by the prosecution, one of substance, and that is that the rifle that was purchased by James Earl Ray, and Ray did purchase that rifle, and the rifle which was owned by James Earl Ray, well, whether he owned it at that moment is a, a matter of contention, but he had owned it certainly within the 48-hour period prior to the murder of Dr. King, that that rifle, purchased and owned by James Earl Ray, was in fact the murder weapon. And he brought forward, again, the FBI, brought forward an expert from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Robert Frazier. <clears throat> and he quoted Robert Frazier, a specific statement made by Robert Frazier, the death slug removed from the body of Dr. King contained land and groove impressions consistent with those present in the barrel of this rifle. And he held up the rifle for us all to see. And he said, that means, in other words, this rifle fired the shot which killed Dr. King. That's not what Mr. Frazier said. And those were other words, but those were other words which had nothing to do with the words that Mr. Frazier had uttered. Now, Mr. Frazier was also the witness for the Warren Commission. He looked at tiny little fragments of bullets, all the size of a head of a pin found in President Kennedy's car. And he could testify before the Warren Commission that those tiny fragments came from the rifle, which he alleged had been owned by Lee Harvey Oswald. And here's the magic phrase. It's always present in every case where the FBI feels it can make the statement that, that those fragments or this bullet came from this weapon to the exclusion of all other weapons in the world. The magic phrase was missing here, wasn't it? Just that it had similar land and groove impressions. That's like saying that I can't say that the person who I see now is the person who I saw when the crime was committed, but there's a similarity. Both of them have two eyes, both have a nose, and both have a mouth. All land and groove impressions are similar. The bullet spins through the rifle barrel and picks up marks of a spiral nature. They're all similar, but if the expert cannot say this bullet came from this weapon to the exclusion of all the weapons of the world, what he is saying in reality is I don't know whether or not this bullet was fired by this rifle. And so the state case fails. The bullet taken from Dr. King's body cannot be shown, cannot be proven, to have come from the rifle which had been purchased by James Earl Ray. <clears throat> and then we got, of course, to what was the heart of the state's case. They brought out their chief witness. They brought out Tommy Wales. Sober as a judge, Tommy Wales, at least when he testified here, it appeared. But according to those who knew him, he was drunk at the time. The assassination of Dr. King, which was not unusual for him, he was drunk almost all of the time. And he came into court and told us exactly what he was told to tell us. But as we examine the evidence more closely, we see that he was drunk at the time, and furthermore, he was not even in the building at the time when the shot was fired. And he never even saw the person who he later sought to identify. We have the testimony of Jack McGee, who knew Tommy Wales for 25 years and never once saw him sober, and who testified that Tommy Wales was drunk that day. So the state's case fails. They can provide no motive. They can provide no proof that the rifle which had been purchased by James Earl Ray was involved in the murder of Dr. King. And they can provide not a single witness who can place James Earl Ray at the scene of the murder on April 4th, 1968. So there is no case. The case fails. Now I know that logically I should sit down and stop at this point. All we have to do is rebut the evidence. In fact, we don't even have to do that. The state must prove the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, or the jury has no choice but to acquit the defendant. But jurors, being human beings, 
are curious as we all are. And I think it's proper for us all to ask the question, well, if James Earl Ray didn't do it, and certainly the state cannot prove that he did, who did do it? Who killed Dr. King? What did happen that day? Well, I think that very likely, although the state cannot prove that Ray's rifle was used, I think very likely the rifle which James Earl Ray had purchased was used that day. But let's trace this back and find out how Ray came to have that rifle until April 3rd, the day before the murder, and how the rifle happened to be where it was found. Now, where was the rifle found? The rifle was found, according to the evidence offered by the state, just outside of the rooming house, 422 and a half, just outside of the rooming house entrance on South Main Street, <clears throat> the rooming house from which evidently the shot was fired. And it was covered with James Earl Ray's fingerprints. No question about that. Prints all over the rifle. And more than that, there was, in the same package of material, there was a suitcase alongside of the rifle. And in the suitcase was a radio with James Earl Ray's name on it, engraved in plastic, and his ID number from the Missouri Penitentiary, engraved in plastic. He had purchased that years before at the Missouri Penitentiary. And all of this material was picked up and in the hands of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now the first logical question, I think, is why would James Earl Ray take all of his belongings with him, drag them up to the second floor, fire the shot which killed Dr. King, and then drag everything down, and just as he was about to enter into his white Mustang, as the prosecution states, parked right in front of the rooming house, for some reason, he places his rifle right down there on the sidewalk and places the suitcase with all of his belongings in the world right down there on the sidewalk. Why? Perhaps because he was concerned that perhaps Inspector Clouseau might be assigned to the case and he wanted to leave the evidence behind so the, the good inspector would stumble over the material and find the rifle with his fingerprints and find his suitcase and everything which identified him. Well, setting aside the logic or lack of logic which one has described to Mr. Ray for having carried off this well-planned effort to kill Dr. King, but then leaving all of his belongings behind, we get to another question. And that is, since this was done, since the rifle was there, how difficult, how easy would it have been for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to have discovered quickly that James Earl Ray was the obvious suspect? Well, this is what the prosecutor told us. The FBI laboratory had access to Ray's fingerprints because Ray was a fugitive and was on a wanted list. Therefore, it was possible, in fact, easy, in fact, easy for the FBI to determine that James Earl Ray was the obvious suspect in the murder of Dr. King. And they had possession, the FBI had possession of that rifle and that other material in their Washington laboratory at 10 o'clock on April 4th, the evening of April 4th, 1968. And was there ever a case in the history of this country with a hundred American cities up in flames when there was a desperate need to inform the people of America that we, the FBI, have some information, we know who the suspect is, we're closing in on him. Yet 13 days after April 4th, 1968, 13 days later, for the first time, the FBI sent out its all points bulletin for Eric Starvo Galt. But it was easy for the FBI to know they were looking for James R. Ray. He was on the wanted fugitive list and Ray's fingerprints were all over the rifle. And the radio was there with his name on it. Two days later, finally, on April 19th, 1968, for the first time, the FBI said it was looking for James Earl Ray. Why? Because they gave him two weeks to leave the country. They never wanted this trial. That's why 10 years have passed since Dr. King was killed and before this trial was permitted to take place. Ray was not arrested because of the actions of American law enforcement authorities although he was wanted by American law enforcement authorities, we're told, he was arrested in London, 
because of Scotland Yard's actions in the case, and Scotland Yard was alerted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And all the FBI did was to give James Earl Ray two weeks to run. And of course, we've heard the question asked a thousand times, if he didn't do it, why did he leave? Why did he flee? Well, James Earl Ray was, in fact, a fugitive from the Missouri Penitentiary. He owed 15 years to that penitentiary and five more if he was prosecuted for the felony of escaping. And as Ray has said on more than one occasion, if they were looking for me for a parking ticket, I would have fled from the country. He wasn't about to try to clear his name in the murder of Dr. King at the risk of spending 20 more years in the Missouri Penitentiary after he proved that he was innocent of the false charges against him. Now, let's take a look at the efforts by the state to obfuscate the basic facts in this case. Let's take a look, for example, at Alice James. Alice James. That's a name that should haunt this country for a long, long time. It's a woman who was living in the rooming house, living with a man named Tommy Wales. Tommy Wales, we have offered into the evidence his certified record of his arrests and convictions in Memphis. 251 arrests and convictions for being publicly drunk in Memphis since 1962. And most of the time since 1962, he didn't even live in Memphis. 251 arrests. But not just for that. How about this one? Assault with intention to commit murder. Permitted to plead guilty to a lesser included assault count. Firing a pistol inside of Memphis. Convicted. Possession of a loaded weapon. Convicted. Possession of a loaded weapon. Convicted. Possession of a loaded weapon. Convicted. State star witness. And he was living with Alice James. Picked up by the Homicide Squad. Two plainclothes officers of the Homicide Squad, get it? Homicide Squad, came to pick her up. What was their jurisdiction? They were assigned to investigating the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. Never before in the history of Tennessee was anyone ever picked up by two plainclothes officers of the Homicide Squad and taken to a mental institution. In Memphis, as in most of the cities, it's not even easy to get a plain, to get a, a single plainclothes officer. In fact, it's not even easy to get a uniformed police officer to pick up someone who you want to have placed in a mental institution. But two plainclothes officers from the homicides, well, they picked her up and they threw her in the John Gaston Hospital. Here are the records of the John Gaston Hospital where she was placed and the record of commitment. What's the charge against her? Hallucinating. She believes she's a witness to the murder of Dr. King. Well, she wasn't the only one who believed it. The FBI and the local police and the state police and the sheriff's department all begged her to sign the affidavit so that James Earl Ray could be brought back from England, extradited, and convicted. They thought she was the only witness. In fact, when the law enforcement authorities called in the artist from the Memphis Commercial Appeal, they just asked Alice James to describe what the killer looked like, the man she saw coming out of the bathroom. Was the FBI hallucinating? Were the Memphis police hallucinating? No, nobody was hallucinating then. Then, Alice James was an important witness. But when James Earl Ray was picked up by these foreign police officers interfering with the American system of justice by catching a criminal, when she was finally picked up, he was finally picked up, then they picked up Alice James, and she wouldn't play the game. And so she was hallucinating because she believes that she was a witness to the murder of Dr. King. Further proof of hallucination, as I read from the record of commitment, she was afraid of the trial. She had death fears. wonder why that was after the FBI and the local police threatened her. I wonder why she had these death fears and was terrified about the trial taking place. And the last proof of hallucination, she fears her husband might attack her or beat her. 
There's the record of the John Gaston Hospital, not the mental aspect of the hospital, but the clinic, the outpatient treatment, the inpatient treatment, showing that over a period of years, more than four years, she was regularly admitted to the hospital because she had been badly beaten by Tommy Wales. Once they suspected she had a fractured skull, many other occasions she had fractured ribs and wounds which had festered and not had healed. But she was hallucinating if she thought that her husband might beat her. Her common-law husband, Tommy Wales. Well, that's the state of justice in the state of Tennessee at the present time. And so a witness was crushed and placed in a mental institution because she was willing to tell the truth. How clever it was of those who planned the assassination of Dr. King to pick in this portion of town, the Skid Row section of town, to pick an old building where people who have suffered and have failed by societal standards all reside. How easy it must have been, they thought, when it was decided the shot would come from a bathroom window there. How easy it would be to manipulate and maneuver around the witnesses to convince them that they'd better see what they were told to have seen. Because they had no lawyers living there, no leaders of society, all of whom are excellent witnesses and all of whom we are taught to respect and understand that these people are people who do not lie. Who could believe that a, a lawyer, a John Dean, or a Haldeman, or an Ehrlichman, or a Mardian, or a Richard Nixon, or an attorney general like John Mitchell, would ever lie, would ever do anything untruthful or unkind. They're the people in the society were sought to respect. But people like Alice James, the losers of society, they can be pushed around. How surprising it must have been when they said to her, this is the picture? Say that's the man you saw. And she said, no, I can't. I didn't see him. Well, say it's the man you, you saw or you will be in a great deal of trouble. She said, I can't. That's not the man I saw. And finally, there's a reward of $100,000 posted by the NACP and other organizations for the information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer. Say it was Ray. Ray will be brought back from England, prosecuted, convicted, and you will get the $100,000. And she said, if I wouldn't lie about what I saw for nothing, I certainly wouldn't lie for $100,000. And they couldn't deal with that reality with that essential sanity in our society. And so they threw her in a mental institution where she remains today, where she has been for 10 years. Isn't it time that somebody reminded the President of the United States who is deeply concerned about human rights in every other country of the world, isn't it time that somebody reminded him and reminded all of us that justice, like charity, should begin at home. Where was Ray? Well, the only witness who saw the murderer flee from the bathroom, the only witness said that he was not the man. It was not James or Ray. Where was he? He was at a service station. He's told us that. That was his testimony, some blocks away. And a series of witnesses have come forward to identify the man they saw with a white Mustang approximately eight blocks away, starting at 5.15 or 5.20 in the afternoon, and there until a couple of minutes to six was in fact James Earl Ray. Where was he at one minute after six? It's not relevant because the prosecution is accurate in one respect only in this case. The killer locked himself in that bathroom from five o'clock in the afternoon and remained there until Dr. King came out on the balcony and then he fired the shot at one minute after six and then he left. And if James Earl Ray can be shown to have been anywhere other than in that bathroom from five o'clock to one minute after six, then he is not the man who fired the shot that killed Dr. King. And a whole slew of leading citizens of Memphis have come forward because they saw him, James Earl Ray, blocks away from the scene between five o'clock and one minute 
after six. Well then, where do we look for the murderers of Dr. King? Where do we look? J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, had a, a letter sent to Dr. King. He ordered that it be sent from a state deep in the South. And the letter told Dr. King in no uncertain terms that he had better kill himself or, or he would be internationally disgraced because of the information that the FBI knew or was willing to develop, enhance, create about him. It was J. Edgar Hoover who sent the message to Dr. King that he should kill himself. James Earl Ray did not send that message. It was J. Edgar Hoover who wanted Dr. King dead. James Earl Ray did not want Dr. King dead. It was J. Edgar Hoover who arranged for Dr. King to be in the Lorraine Motel on April 4th, 1968. James Earl Ray made no such arrangements. And above all, it was J. Edgar Hoover and his Federal Bureau of Investigation who investigated the murder and who suppressed all of the relevant facts about the murder of Dr. King. It was not James Earl Ray who investigated the facts surrounding the murder, who obfuscated and destroyed the facts surrounding the murder of Dr. King. Dr. King was engaged in the spring of 1968 in some of the most important activity of his life. He was calling together a massive demonstration in Washington, D.C. He was calling together thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps eventually it would have been millions of Americans, poor whites and poor blacks, Chicanos and Indians and Orientals, bringing them together in a rainbow of demonstration against the economic structure in the society in which millions of Americans go to bed hungry at night, in which today, years after Franklin Delano Roosevelt told us about it in his inaugural address, today, more than a third of a nation remains ill-fed, ill-housed, ill-clothed. It was Dr. King was conducting a war upon a structure which created poverty and was inviting hundreds of thousands of people in this country from all over America to move to Washington, D.C., to set up a tent city <clears throat> in front of the three House office buildings and the two Senate office buildings and to remain there until the Congress began to deal with the needs for changing the economic structure of the society. In the midst of all that, he was invited to come to Memphis. And some of his advisors said to him, no, don't go there. Don't take your, your eye off the national activity. Don't be diverted by this distraction. And he reminded them of the biblical injunction to render service to the least of these, and he was off to Memphis. And the last demonstration was to be in Memphis on March 28th, a nonviolent march through the city in support of the sanitation workers who were fighting not for higher wages, but for human decency. You remember the, the slogans that they spoke and the banners that they wore that said, I am a man. That was what the campaign was about. It was irresistible for Dr. King. And he went there to lead the nonviolent demonstration, and all of a sudden it turned into a violent confrontation in which one young black man was shot to death by the police, and mace was used, I believe, for the first time. Mace was used against American citizens on the streets of one of our cities. And now we know who brought that about. Agent provocateurs within the Federal Bureau of Investigation paraded as militant young blacks and brought about the confrontation with the police. And so Dr. King had to return. And where was he going to stay? Last time he was in town, he stayed at the Holiday in Rivermont, a huge edifice which provides absolute security once you're inside of that building. But Hoover did not want him there. He wanted him in the Lorraine Motel on that balcony, in the Lorraine Motel balcony, which is built like a shooting gallery with buildings across the street providing excellent access to that open balcony, a motel with no single lobby so that one would have to be exposed for a long period of time in walking to the room. And Hoover, we now have the document. Mr. Hoover sent directions to the special agent in charge 
of the Memphis Federal Bureau of Investigation office. And the instructions were, in essence, get King into the Lorraine Motel. And so they did. They sent out a press statement, not to be attributed to the FBI, of course. That was the, the rule in the working arrangement they had with the two Memphis newspapers and the three Memphis television stations and the many Memphis radio stations. Don't attribute it to us. We'll even write the headline for you, what the FBI documents say. Headline at all. Do as I say, not as I do, says King. King comes here to Memphis. And he says to the Negroes, boycott white-owned places, only patronize Negro-owned establishments, but he himself stays at the Holiday Inn Rivermont, owned by white people. Why doesn't he check into the Lorraine Motel? Hoover actually named the hotel he wanted him in. Why doesn't he check into the Lorraine Motel, owned by Negroes, a perfectly respectable place, and because of the embarrassment. Dr. King's reservations were changed by his aide from the Holiday Inn Rivermont, placed in the Lorraine Motel, and Hoover had him where he wanted him, on that balcony. But that kind of evidence is not presented at the trial now, because the prosecution is not interested in all of the facts. And the authorities have never been interested in the facts. But I think we, the people of this country, are now at last interested in, and able perhaps for the first time, to secure the basic information. And so we look at the evidence in the case and we say, when will the facts be known by the American people? How can they be known? If James Earl Ray is acquitted at this trial, then all of America must begin to look at the events of April 4th, 1968 with new eyes. And all of America must ask, who did kill Dr. King if this jury says, there is not enough evidence, certainly, to show that James R. Ray did it. Who did do it? Who killed Dr. King? So we ask, how long must James Earl Ray, a decade after the murder, how long must he remain in jail? And only you, the jury, can answer, not much longer. How long must we be denied the truth about the murder of Dr. King. And only you, this jury, representing the American people, can answer, not much longer. How long must Alice James remain illegally incarcerated in a Tennessee mental institution? Ten years now since Dr. King was killed. Ten years since she was thrown into that institution for wishing to speak the truth about what she had seen and what she had heard. And only you, speaking for the American people, can answer, not much longer. You are the only jury that James Earl Ray has ever had. Free him. Free Alice James. And free us all from the myths of the past. So that we may enter together into the bright, fresh dawn of the truth. Then together... We may join with Dr. King, who taught us all that truth, though crushed to earth, will rise again. You have now heard the evidence presented by both the state and the defendant. It is now for you to determine if the defendant, James Earl Ray, is guilty of the crime charged, the murder of Martin Luther King, Jr. If you are convinced of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, you should, each of you, return a verdict of guilty as charged. However, if you have not been convinced of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. You are, as has been said, the only jury that James Earl Ray has ever had in this case. Please take your responsibility seriously. Thank you. You have been listening to The Trial of James Earl Ray by Mark Lane. All rise. The bailiff was played by Richard Scobie. This honorable court is now in session. Now this case and the unfortunate murder of Martin Luther King Jr. have been widely discussed in the news media. The judge was played by Maury Abrams. 
I am going to ask you to dismiss from your mind everything that you have heard about this case. This is the case of the state of Tennessee against James Earl Ray. The prosecutor was played by Tony Vorno. The evidence will show that the defendant, acting alone, was a cold-blooded murderer of Martin Luther King, Jr. It got so that the very sight of King would galvanize Ray. George McMillan was played by Donald Freed. Somebody's got to get him, he would say. Well, well, I wasn't working, so I was, you know, I hadn't been too well, but I was just taking it easy, talking to friends. Tommy Wales was played by William Stein. And sort of looking around for a job of some kind. You, the only jury that James Earl Ray has ever had. The defense attorney was Mark Lane. Will have the final responsibility to arrive at the appropriate conclusions and to render a fair verdict. Now, since Ray left in April 1967 and never returned, Harrison Ford was played by Maurice Ogden. I can answer categorically that he never had access at the Missouri State Penitentiary to a television set. I told him I was afraid of the trial of James Earl Ray. Alice James was played by Rosalie Abrams. Because the police and FBI wanted me to lie and said I would be in trouble if I told what I saw. I went back to my cab and called the dispatcher. Jack McGee was played by Harvey Kendall. I told him that Tommy Wales was too drunk to carry and he gave me another assignment. It was my understanding we were supposed to purchase some guns and apparently take them to New Orleans. The voice of James Earl Ray was recorded in prison by Mark Lane. And that was all I knew about the project. I didn't think what I saw was relevant or important. Wilson Jordan was played by Edward Greenley. I saw him about eight blocks away, about ten minutes before the shot was fired. I sat in the car and thought about Dr. King. I had been with him so much every time he came to Memphis, and I had heard him speak so often that I practically was one of his disciples. And Detective Ed Reddit was played by Robert Johnson. I thought about him at the Lorraine without adequate protection. Technical production was by Ed Hammond. This docudrama was directed by Donald Freed, and it was produced for Pacifica Radio by Lucia Chappell and Michael P. Hodell.